Welcome to the Pomerantz Mentor presented by ProScan MRI Education Foundation. And we're going to be covering the wrist, a small part, a part with a lot of anatomic information packed into a small space. So let's get started with something rather straightforward, and that is the application of MR in the wrist. And for you primary care physicians and for imagers, the most common indication for MR of the wrist is ulnar-sided wrist pain, of which there are numerous causes. One example would be uh, inflammation of the extensor carpi ulnaris, which is common in young men. But in middle-aged adults and in athletes, perhaps the most common indication is to exclude injury to the triangulofibrocartilage complex, whose anatomy we'll review in detail. It's not just a disc-like structure. It's a disc-like structure with complex attachments. Arthritis monitoring. While this seems simple, and it appears like it could be done with conventional radiographs, many organizations now require an evaluation of soft tissue, particularly panis formation and rheumatoid arthritis, to decide whether expensive drugs like Remicade should be used and are working efficaciously. Then we have infection. While infection may sometimes be an obvious clinical diagnosis, a swollen wrist or even a sausage digit may present as an infection occultly, especially if the infection is atypical and not of pyogenic etiology. MR does a fantastic job at identifying aggressive intraarticular processes. Digit injuries and masses. This will be a separate discussion when we get to the finger, but MR is used primarily to assess injuries to the pulley mechanisms and to the flexor tendon mechanism to see the level of retraction of the flexor unit. Tunnel syndromes. While this is a diagnosis where EMG and clinical evaluation reign supreme, sometimes the diagnosis is ill-defined and perhaps it's due to a secondary process such as an aneurysm in Guillain's canal producing an ulnar nerve palsy or a bifid or duplicated median nerve with an anomalous vessel next to it producing secondary compression. So when carpal tunnel syndromes are present or ulnar tunnel syndromes are present and there's a suspected mass or there's atypicality in the neural distribution, then it's time for an imaging procedure and MR is that procedure. For complex carpal instabilities, especially when you want to evaluate the intrinsic ligaments, the scapholunate and the lunatotriquetral ligament, or for radio ulnar instabilities, MR reigns supreme, even without the injection of intraarticular contrast, which is uncommonly to rarely needed when you're assessing the wrist and these intrinsic ligaments at the expert level. Osteonecrosis. This is a diagnosis that has fallen to MRI. In the past, we've used dynamic contrast enhanced MRI to improve our accuracy. Now, the accuracy is only improved with dynamic imaging by perhaps 1 to 2 percent. And so non-contrast MRI looking for areas of necrotic low signal bone on all sequences has a very high accuracy rate and positive predictive value for AVN or avascular necrosis. Fractures of the wrist. This may seem a little bit ridiculous, especially to the clinicians that are, that are listening to this. I mean, a wrist fracture, you, you do an x-ray in your office and you see the fracture, right? Well, more than 50% of all fractures sustained in the wrist have no cortical involvement. They're intramedullary, endosteal, cancellous bone, spongy bone fractures. Those don't show up on an x-ray. In fact, they hardly show up on a CT. The best test, the most sensitive test, the most accurate test to look for a fracture, especially of the scaphoid, a critical bone, is with a quick T1 fat-weighted and heavily water-weighted MRI. Tendon rupture. Well, we've alluded to this when we talked about the finger, but in the wrist, in the carpal tunnel space, and even proximal to the carpal tunnel, MR is invaluable 
not really in diagnosing the rupture, which is a clinical diagnosis that is made by seeing which fingers and which portion of the finger can move, but by identifying where the torn ends are located, whether there's a piece of bone that's been taken off with the avulsed tendon, and we will assign a specific zone where the retracted areas are located. And we'll talk about these zones in subsequent learning experiences together. And finally, there's just the search and destroy swollen hands, swollen wrists, swollen fingers scenario where it's hard to tell what's going on. It's hard to get a good physical examination due to pain. MR frequently, in fact, in the overwhelming majority of cases, sends you down a road, a specific road of infection or inflammatory disease or trauma or one of the other diagnoses mentioned and gives you the right tools to make the next diagnostic maneuver. Now let's briefly talk about sequences and introduce them. For in the next vignette, we're going to get into sequences in a very big way. You know, T1, as you know, is a simple sequence that can be done on any scanner, and it is the fat-weighted image. Its real strength is in looking at the character of medullary, cancellous, and dostial bone. In fact, while it's very sensitive, not as sensitive as some of the water-weighted sequences, it gives you great specificity. It'll tell you whether you have a microfracture, a macrofracture, a contusion, and some of the other intermediate to low-grade bone injuries that we'll be discussing. The 3D gradient echo sequence, incoherent, is also known as the T1 spoiled gradient echo sequence. It's not really a terrific sequence for the bone, but because of the thinness that the three-dimensional acquisition affords us, we can see very small structures, especially the intrinsic and sometimes the extrinsic ligaments. The PD spur or proton density spur, a water-weighted sequences. The PD or water-weighted sequence known as the PD spur, spur standing for spectrally sensitive and specific inversion recovery is the all-purpose versatile water-weighted sequence. So how do you tell if you're a non-imager that you have this sequence? The fat is black and the water is white. It's that simple. Look for something that looks like water. What looks like water? Joint fluid. Or if you're down in the abdomen, urine, bile, vitreous humor, cerebrospinal fluid, any water containing structure that you know has water in it, if it's white, it's a water weighted image. Now sometimes we'll perform extreme fat suppression and you'll be able to tell just how sensitive the sequence put before you is to identifying water and subsequently edema. And that's simply by looking at the fat. The blacker the fat, the more sensitive the sequence you have. It's like a bone scan. Now, anything that has swelling or edema in it is going to be white. So you're going to be looking for the hot spots or the white spots on the fat suppressed proton density spur sequence. The all purpose, versatile, and sensitive sequence for all musculoskeletal imaging. And then we have something called the 2D gradient echo sequence. How will you know you have this? Well, it will say GRE, somewhere in the upper left or right-hand corner of the image. The bones will appear a little shiny. The muscles will appear a little shiny. And this sequence is often performed so that the water is emphasized and the interface between water and cartilage is highlighted. This sequence is used to look at the intraarticular space for loose bodies, to see hemosiderin, to see chronic blood, and to look at the cartilaginous surface to see if it's eroded and the thickness of that erosion. Now, the fast 3D coherent gradient echo sequence is also another water-weighted sequence, but unlike the 2D, it gives you a little more spatial detail. 
So for very, very fine structures, besides the hyaline cartilage, for ligaments and for some tendons, it can be an excellent supplementary sequence. Another newer sequence that can either be fat-weighted, T1 appearing, or water-weighted, T2 appearing, is called the steady-state free precession sequence. Somewhere on the image it'll say SSFP. It goes under various names, one of which is Fiesta, but SSFP is the scientific name. Because of the robust nature of this pulsing sequence, you get tremendous signal to noise, but at the same time, this affords you the ability to get very, very thin slices. So ultra high resolution, 0.6 millimeter, one millimeter slices can be had with this sequence. At low field, which is often much maligned, but is used heavily in musculoskeletal imaging, the STIR, or short time inversion recovery, is another very sensitive water weighted sequence and although it's not as aesthetically pleasing as some of the water weighted sequences at high field it has tremendous contrast resolution and will not miss a bone injury or an area of soft tissue swelling you may not know it but the contrast resolution of a low field scanner for T1 imaging for fat weighted imaging is actually better than it is for high field imaging the spatial resolution is not as good, but the contrast resolution on a T1 weighted image is better. Something perhaps your mother didn't tell you. Politically incorrect, but nevertheless true. The proton density image, where you use a long TR and a short TE. This is not used very commonly in standard MRI or in musculoskeletal MRI. When you take a proton density image, which has very high signal to noise, looks like a T1 weighted image, and you put on top of it a quality fat suppression sequence, now you're back to the proton density fat suppression image, or PD spur, and now you've just taken something that is not heavily used, not very sensitive, and with the fat suppression, you've made it one of the most valuable, versatile, sensitive sequences in all of musculoskeletal MRI. Some general protocol suggestions. In the wrist, the coronal view is king. The coronal view is what you're used to seeing in your AP view of the wrist. We'll take a series of sequences and place them together in a row and compare them and scroll them side by side to improve our diagnostic acumen. In the wrist, Spatial detail for these fine, small structures is critical. The field of view is what determines, to some degree, the spatial resolution along with the matrix. We want the field of view to be down around 10. So if you are a radiologist, an imager, an orthopedic surgeon, a hand surgeon, or any other allied health professional, and you're looking at your MR of the wrist, and you go to that line that says FOV, and it's more than 10 or perhaps 12, then the spatial detail that you need for crisp diagnosis is probably not there. The smaller you can get, the better. If you can get under eight, fantastic. Better spatial detail. And the finger, I prefer a field of view of less than six. When you perform your versatile, sensitive, proton density, fat suppression sequence, also known as PD spur, where the water is white, the echo time for you imagers out there should not be all the way down low or as short as possible, which would be typical of a proton density image. What I want you to do is take that TE and bring it up around 40, which is more intermediate. So it's kind of a hybrid sequence with a long TR and an intermediate TE. This would be more relevant for the imagers and for the technical people that are watching this vignette. The sagittal view. The sagittal view gives you a long view of the wrist and of the finger. So when you're looking for structures that are long, like arteries or tendons, flexor or extensor tendons, this would be a time to employ the sagittal. It's also a great way to look for the alignment of the wrist just as you would with a lateral conventional radiograph. 
In general, the axial view is reserved for anatomic positioning of abnormalities and masses. So if you want to see a mass in its position, if you want to look at the position of the nerves relative to tunnels, as in the syndrome of Guillain's Canal or carpal tunnel syndrome, or you want to see the position of bodies, the axial view is king. Finally, we show you just one example of a T1 or fat-weighted image. The fat is white. The water is gray or dark and is barely visible, blending in with the areas of hyaline cartilage. The dark area beneath the hyaline cartilage is cortex. The medullary or cancellous bone is not only visible, the trabecula of the bone is visible. So crisp is the visibility of this bone that you can diagnose osteopenia and osteoporosis with MRI with great accuracy. You can see, if you're a clinician, the collapsed capsule between the carpal bones as these thin, dark slits. You can even see the areas of friction or weight-bearing trabecula that are a little exaggerated in the distal lunate, a normal variant. One can see the tiny ligaments, the scapholunate ligament. It looks like the scapholunate ligament is not attaching to the scaphoid, but in fact it's attaching to the cartilage, not directly to the cortex, as it often does. The same is true of the lunatotriquetral ligament. It's attaching to cortex on one side and to cartilage on the other side. No, it's not torn. It's simply a cartilaginous attachment. And this attachment will change as you move from palmar to dorsal. And then we have our radius, whose physis is closed, our ulna, whose physis is closed with a small physial scar, and a beautiful view of our triangular fibrocartilage. It's so beautiful, I want to cry. It's like you're holding it in your hand. We can see the radial attachment that looks a little bit like a goblet, the foveal attachment, the styloidal attachment, the peripheral ulnar collateral ligament and capsule. This linear structure extending underneath the triquetrum is the lateral lunate ligament. This filler tissue is known as the ulnomeniscus homolog. The thicker tissue immediately under the extensor carpial narus is known as the extensor carpial narus subsheath. So beautiful is this simple coronal T1 weighted image that shows all the bones of the wrist, the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetrum, the lesser multangular, the capitate and the hamate. The only one missing is the one off the thumb, the trapezium. Well that concludes our discussion, our introductory discussion of the wrist, focusing mostly on the applications and how you would use MRI of the wrist and why each one of these applications is indicated and works and how it's supplemented with various other clinical and laboratory studies. In addition, we just touched on some of the basic sequences, but in our next vignette, we're going to drill into these sequences deeply. We're going to get well below ground. Have a great day. Thank you.